Welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is the co-founder of Caffeine and Kilos, the co-founder of Excel Health and Fitness in Manteca, California, and the YouTube channel The Lifting Fix, Danny Lear. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast for the fifth or sixth time. Yeah, man. Good morning. I I, I did the the Google search because uh, that lifting fix thing. Once you you had a whole bunch of videos on that, um, and then. At some point, I, I would figure you'd run out of material or something, but you still got that up there as like a reference point uh, on your website. Yeah, that was uh, kind of one of those accidental projects. Uh, like somebody, based at the time, I was doing a lot in, in weightlifting, in the sport of weightlifting, and as far as just um, competing and then coaching uh, athletes and stuff. And, you know, you can learn different techniques and everything, but um, being able to watch somebody move and then just give them one drill to fix their biggest problem, right? Just triage, triage what's going on. Okay, this is their biggest issue. And what's one thing they can do to fix that? And that was something that I um, was pretty good at. And I think a lot of that's from a uh, background in coaching. You know, I coached high school wrestling for 10 years and <laughs> a lot of that type of stuff. And um, so that was something I was good at. So I was doing that. And then, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. One time I was giving someone a drill. And I thought, man, like a lot of people have the same problem. And so I had someone record it. Hey, record me doing this. Uh, I'm going to send it to some other people. And then I said, well, might as well just post it. <laughs> and I did. And so then um, the next week, I was like, maybe we'll do another one. And then I just did one a week for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of fun. Turned into a little bit of a travel show. Like I was in up by Toronto in Canada and it was time to do one. I had to release one that week. And so we filmed one up there. And then with caffeine and kilos, we were, I was traveling around the country, meeting with some people that were strength conditioning coaches, um, different things like that. And so I remember yeah, I was in Louisiana and there was a coach there who's a very good weightlifting coach. And so I had him do one, right? Hey, here we go. What's one, you know, problem people have, or, or here's an issue people have, like, what would you do if this was one of your athletes? Right. And so it was, it was a fun project. And then what happened is uh, it got abandoned because uh, some stuff went on. Basically, I had um, in one of my businesses, uh, uh, one of my business partners was leaving the company, which is fine. Uh, it was just that time in life for him to do that. But then going through that, that that transition took quite a bit of time. And so uh, other projects got kind of mm -hmm. pushed aside. But it was it was interesting. Yeah, kind of the at the end, actually, I have a, a friend that does professionally make videos and he helped me out. He said, hey, man, uh, he wanted to do it. He said, Kai, can we make like a like some high quality videos for this, uh, like a little project and it could be a, a product, you know, if yeah. I wanted to release it. So we got that all made and done. And then right after, as he was editing that is when all of a sudden things changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My attention had to go elsewhere. So that project kind of took a back seat or. Mm -hmm. as I work through some other stuff. Um, but now it's totally been great <laughs> because uh, the videos are still out there. People can still reference them. And that project um, we saw, like followed through on and bundled it up. And instead of it being a, a, a project from, or a product or project for myself, I just rolled it into caffeine and kilos. Mm -hmm. It was like a year later. And I was like, man, I've got this thing totally done. We're doing nothing with it. <laughs> Maybe yeah. We should uh, make it a caffeine and kilos product essentially. Yeah. Uh, and so we, so we sell that, uh, on the site and also use it for different promotions and stuff. You got me, um, on the, uh, word, a focal word for the year. And my, word my word year. for this year is, uh, is finish. And I, and I thought about that because there's a lot of things that people have ideas about projects that they should do. Yeah. And you are definitely the type of person who just does the project. So I know the lifting fix wasn't necessarily my, my goal for the year is this, it was right. just that, Hey, this is a need. This is an opportunity to do something and let's do it. So even if it, and that thing doesn't end up being like, you're not known for the lifting fix, but it's one of those cool, fun side projects and opportunities you took advantage of. Uh, so how does that kind of play into that attitude play into your, your goal setting for not necessarily like January 1st, but just, uh, throughout the year, your goal setting. I think people, tend to look at a big thing they want to accomplish, a big goal or whatever, and then it's intimidating. And a lot of people, you know, it's like this uh, paralysis by analysis, right? Like it seems like such a big thing to take on that you don't even start, you know? Uh, and, you know, whereas the the reality is that to a certain degree, like you just need to start. <laughs> you just got to start working on the path and you're going to do 
you're going to make some wrong decisions uh, for sure. But the thing is, um, that's always going to happen. Like you were never going to avoid making mistakes or making errors. And the best way to learn is by screwing up and then uh, not doing it again, right? Like that's always the goal, right? Like um, I actually, I talked to a lot of my, my, uh, my coworkers, like people about that all the time is, you know, um, you give them a new job or you have a new, a new employee and you just kind of give them the tasks and you say, okay, like here, go do these things, think for yourself, make decisions uh, and make mistakes. Like I want you to go make mistakes, uh, but then just don't make the same one again. <laughs> right. And then that, that's kind of how it goes. If you, the last thing you want is people, you know, so nervous or scared to make a mistake, they just don't do anything. Right. You're mm -hmm. never going to, you're never going to progress that way. You're never going to learn. You're never going to learn that way. Yeah. I've had students so. that uh, make a mistake and they say, oh, I learned my lesson. I said, no, you didn't. Because right now you're feeling bad that you made the mistake, but you only can prove that you learned when you have the chance to do it again and you don't. And some of them look at me like, yeah. what does that even mean? And other ones like, oh, that, yeah, that's a good point because they keep falling for the same sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've made the same mistake multiple times. There's no question about that. Yeah, it's just <laughs> right. it's just different enough where you don't recognize it. It's like, oh, yeah. wait, this is the exact same thing. This this is the same thing. It was it was just a little bit different, but no, it's, it's yeah. the same thing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fun to convince yourself it's different. Like, oh, this isn't the same. This is totally different. Um, yeah, this time, exactly. This time when I'm doing the same activity, my intentions are different. So therefore, mm -hmm. the results, and usually turns out the results are the same. But, yeah. You know. One of the biggest things in like the, the writing realm is it's not necessarily mistakes. It's more like the rejection. And so there's this idea that what was the mistake? Why isn't this? Is it not the right time for this? Uh, did I did it? Right. It was something about my pitch, something about the, the writing portion of it. So that's a really it's a lot more ambiguous. It can be super frustrating because you don't have that answer. You don't necessarily get a, hey, work on this or it's not this. Or, you know, if you happen to do this a little bit different or this is what we're looking for, sometimes it's just you hear nothing. And it can right. be, it can be kind of discouraging. But, yeah. I could, yeah, I could totally see that. That's a, yeah. The, the, the part, part of the making mistakes, right. Is the feedback loop, right. You see, like you learn what didn't work and, and if you do something differently, but if you don't really get that feedback, if it's just kind of like, no, <laughs> but, but not, not any specific feedback on that, then you got to kind of go in and, and yeah, I guess you just try something different, right? And then may, hopefully the thing that you try different, hopefully you identified the same thing that, that they did, right? Mm -hmm. Is that one of the most important things in the entrepreneurial world is to be able to like have thick skin, take criticism? Or like where does that rank as far as, as needs in the entrepreneurial realm? I think that that's the most important thing in the world realm, not just in the entrepreneurial realm, right? Like, um, uh, differentiating between um, feedback and uh, someone just being rude <laughs> or whatever, right? And then and understanding, like it's. I think that um, myself included, right? I think that we we take things personally, right? Uh, in we are the center of our own world. Everybody is, right? Because you you see everything that's happening in your life and everything that's going on, and and so it's easy to when something goes wrong, it's easy to uh, well something goes wrong sometimes people blame others and then as you learn more it's like well if you what are the things you can control and you really most of the time you can't control what other people do you can control what you do and how you see things uh, and so once you start when things go wrong instead of pointing the finger at others just having some self-reflection as far as like okay uh how could i have avoided this or in the future how can i avoid this then you realize like it's not a big deal like that doesn't make you a bad person it doesn't make you stupid or whatever for making mistakes or even for just being involved with something you just say, okay, well, you know, next time I'm going to do this differently. Or, um, you know, if I could at the, every night as I put my kids to bed, so I have a, a six-year-old and a 10-year-old, um, and we do two questions. We say, what was your favorite part of the day? And then if you could do the day over, what would you do differently? And sometimes uh, my oldest, Maddie, she says, like, she's like, well, nothing. I had a great day. I said, well, that's not really how this works. Like, there's always something you could have done. You had a great day. Fantastic. Like, but what could have made it even better? Right. Um, so, like, at no point, if you did this entire day over again, you wouldn't have done a single thing different. Like, that is, like, I hope that's not true. Right. <laughs> um, you should always be looking for some sort of a growth thing. And it doesn't, it's not always some major thing. It could be small little stuff. Right. Um, you know, it's like, ah, oh, you know what? Actually, like, I really had to go to the bathroom in class uh, and I would have gone before I went in, <laughs> like, like little stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but I think that awareness that you can always be improving and doing things differently and learning from, you know, your life, uh, is it's the same thing. It's the same, it's the same question. There was the same theory of having thick skin and understanding that feedback isn't uh, a personal thing, whereas it may, it, it doesn't define you. It just defines your actions and, and helps you make better, more informed, take better actions, more informed mm-hmm. actions. And so uh, when you kind of, when you, when you think about it in that way, when someone gives you feedback on something, it's fine because you understand like the, the feedback's not defining you. It's defining things you did or actions you did or didn't do and um, helps you to, to make those choices better. So I think a big part of that is uh, having the self-awareness to be able to reflect yourself. And then once you can do that, other people will give you feedback all good because mm-hmm. it's kind of the same thing. If you're in the habit of doing it for yourself anyway, it's just getting outside eyes to, to give you the same, same information. So how does that roll into to some of the goals that you do when you're setting a goal? Do you think about uh, potential angles, feedback, people that can help you out with uh, feedback or uh, how does that, how does that play in your, your goal setting? Well, I think that having other people involved, I think a big part of, of goal setting um, is maybe more, yes, getting feedback from people is important, but I think that a big part of goal setting is where other people come into play is through accountability, right? Um, and I think telling people your goals, especially the bigger and more audacious they are, uh, is a major factor in, in accomplishing them. Uh, you know, like I'm writing this book right now, and I didn't, you know, at first, like I told a few people, whatever, but like, I didn't really want to tell, I don't want to like post about it or tell people about it or publicly talk about it too much. Cause then it's real, man. Like then you got to do it. And now it's like, you know, um, I mean, I'm definitely finishing this thing. Like I, uh, I am financially invested as well as, uh, um, you know, socially or whatever you want to say for accountability. Uh, but so it's like, well, if I know I'm doing this, I need to just start talking about it and saying it and telling people because, mm-hmm. Um, the more people I tell or the more I talk about it, the more accountable I am, the more I have to fall through on this because um, people are going to be asking me about it. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's something that's going to happen. So I think that's a big part of it too. Like you set, you set these goals and then, you know, pub, either public accountability is great um, or, you know, I had this business coach for a long time, Craig Ballantyne, and he always said, uh, the secret sauce is accountability and uh, the secret ingredient in the secret sauce is to tell someone uh, or be accountable to someone who you deeply do not want to disappoint, <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, yeah, the, the, the neighbor kid that's four years old, like I could tell him I'm writing a book <laughs> and if I don't, like I could still, that doesn't, yeah. that's not going to eat me up, right? Yeah. Um, like I got, that kid is eating his booger still, so I'm not really worried about his mm-hmm. opinion. But, you know, uh, if I say it publicly and I post about it and I know that, you know, I have friends that um, have done, I have, you know, yourself included, but friends that have written books themselves and friends that have, you know, taken companies from, you know, run $48 million a year businesses and stuff. And I don't want those people to, uh, you know, ask me how it's coming along and me say like, oh, I abandoned it. (laughs) I didn't do it. I didn't didn't finish it or I didn't whatever. Right. Um, yeah. And so I think that that accountability piece um, is is really important is really important for that as far as others are combined concerned. Have you noticed a difference in like with these different goals and challenges? What the product is? What you your I don't know. I think it was your oldest that was uh, taking piano lessons, and so you mm-hmm. decided to take piano lessons too. And so when it came to recital time, you're like, well, shoot, I might as well. T- if I'm having my daughter do this, I might as well do a recital. But if you were trash, it didn't really matter. It was yeah. still endearing. It was still good. Whereas, you know, as a as you know, you have influence in the weightlifting industry. If you can't lift or you don't lift, then it's like, oh well, you know, physically it just doesn't really make sense. So you have that pressure there. Um, with writing, do you feel the same sort of pressure? Because it's more like an intellectual expression. If you can't lift the weights, it's like, oh, well, it's physical, but still, you know, you're you're very very strong. Whereas the intellectual thing, man, if I write this book and it sucks, are people going to think that I'm a dummy? Yeah, uh, yeah, man, that's that's for sure. That, that's for sure part of it. Uh, I, man, yeah. Well, let me put it this way: like, I I know the information is good um, as far as that that type of stuff goes. 
but yeah, but the actual writing of it is where it gets interesting, right? Like I, I um, read quite a bit um, or over the past, whatever, 10 years I've read quite a bit, um, including, you know, whatever self-improvement, um, you know, biz- and business books and leadership books, and that type of thing, um, you know, nonfiction. But also, like, I've read, you know, a fair amount of fiction and, you know, like, really well-written, uh, well-written books. And, you know, so it's funny because, like, you're writing and you're like, well, um, the idea that I'm going to sound like Steinbeck is, like, out of the question. So, like, probably shouldn't even. So then you're like, well, should I? I don't think the answer is, like, well, don't try then. <laughs> you, know, you know, like, um, there's something from there's something uh, to be said for uh, staying within yourself and not, not trying too hard or trying to, to um, like stretching too far to where it's just terrible. Like it's it clear that you're uh, playing out of your league and, and, and whatever. Um, but at the same time, like you got to try, like do your best, like what, you know, within your own voice, your own thing, like what, um, how can you do that? How can you kind of make the most out of what you got? And it is interesting because in, it's the it's the process the, the like a book specifically just like the time frame of how long it takes is different because uh, I've been practicing you know I've I've gone through stretches of a year or more um, where I was writing a weekly email and that type of stuff and a lot of it was about practice like I just need to practice at one point I decided three or four years ago that or four or five five or six years ago maybe anyway that uh, one thing that really helped me in business and just in life and and stuff is I just need to be better at writing like I need to be a better writer. And so I uh, bought like five or six books about being a better writer uh, and then read them all back to back, just like a uh, fire hose uh, information on, on writing. And, uh, and a man funny, like how this always goes is kind of found that they all kind of have the same themes, the same advice, the same everything. And it's, you know, from different authors and, and a lot, and that's mostly what I focused on was books by uh, successful authors that then have tips on on writing right mm-hmm. um so they're like uh books like Anne lamont there's one called bird by bird which is really good like stephen king's on writing is pretty interesting uh ray bradbury wrote a book about writing um dorothea brandt has a book about writing so like you start going through these um eb white has a book about writing so mm-hmm. you start going through these authors that have had a lot of success and it's like okay well they probably know something about the process and, and then you, they're all different backgrounds and they all kind of say the same thing. You are like, all right, well, I guess that's what I should do or what I should pursue. Um, and so then I started writing these, you know, these emails there, you know, those are whatever, 350 to, you know, at most maybe 700 words or something. And uh, what I, I started see, searching feedback, seeking feedback. Uh, at the time, I had a, a lady that worked with me at Caffeine and Kilos, who her parents are both uh, English professors. And so, and that was her major and she was a English major and all that. And, and so just as far as like, you know, just the grammar side of things and, and word usage and, and that type of stuff, the stuff that really I was, I'm the weakest on in, in the writing were kind of her strengths. Uh, and so she, so what I did is I, I wrote this, uh, I wrote this, these basically small essays out and then I would send them to her and I'd say, please grade my paper. <laughs> because as, as adults, we don't get that anymore, right? Yeah. When, right. when we're in school and we're getting feedback and everything, we don't want it, right? It sounds like, you know, you know, you're getting those things back and they're all marked up and read and you're like, oh shit, I got so much more work to do. Uh, but then as an adult, you don't have that opportunity. Like, what do you do? Who do you send mm-hmm. this to? What do you, how do you get this checked? Who can I send this to to like edit this for uh, content as well as for grammar and everything, right? Um, so she would do that for me. She would just like edit these things out, leave notes and suggestions and corrections and all that type of stuff. And then I would um, some to talk her about it, uh, or if not, just like make the changes. Like I learned from it, and I, I did that that for probably half of a year. Uh, you know, so 25 times I wrote these essays and sent them to her for to grade my work, basically. Um, so the the point of that is that those I felt like I could really dig into those um, you know on a sentence level right as far as you know uh, the quality of writing and and stuff like that more than just like getting content out right Mm -hmm. Um, with the book at this point there'll be time for that during the revisions process but right now like dude I'm getting 2,500 words a week down and that's what's happening and that (laughs) is the most important thing right because I have to have this raw manuscript complete by a certain date and then, then we can go. And so I, I, I meet with an editor once a week 
Um, but and he gives me feedback and stuff. But at this point, I don't even get to. I'm not even getting back to make the all of the revisions and recommendations um, that he's giving me. We discuss them all and I understand them, and I see that and all everything. Um, but then it's like, you know, hey man, by next week I got another 2,500 words that are going to be on this on this page, and so um, he's he's reminding me all the time. It's like there's time. You will have time for revisions. Like once we get the raw manuscript out, then we can go back and do kind of uh, sweeping revisions and stuff. And then there will be time as well to to go through it at a sentence level and clean it up. Yeah. That's the battle right now is the uh, wanting it to be wanting to sound like someone who actually has some skill or ability to write something, mm-hmm. um, but not overstretching to where you sound. Sometimes you, people try people try so hard they sound like an idiot. Right. And so it's the, that's the, that's the catch is like, uh, I don't want to sound like a, um, like a Neanderthal. I also don't want to sound like, uh, someone who's like, you know, where you're trying so hard just doesn't make sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and then at the same time, just like continue this production level of 2,500 words a week, you know, come hell or high water. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a difficult thing. And there's a difference between, like words and value and, and content versus meaningful content. And that's, you have word goals cause you have to have those too, but then getting better at, okay, what's the value in this? And some days or some weeks it's like, Whoa, man, the words, it was a struggle. <clears throat> and then the yeah. editing part, that's the most important part is going back. And there was some sort of idea and sometimes you can go back and you can fix it and you can deal with it. And other times it can be, be pretty tough, but yeah, it's especially in the, in the, you're in the fitness industry, um, in the outdoor industry. It's there's a lot of people who are just pushing content, 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 and it's just it's it's it gets a little bit uh, rugged at times because th- not everybody has really valuable content. I think the best people are the ones who have valuable content, and there's something that uh, that comes with it because they're getting good at that. But it, when they first started off, everyone talks about how it wasn't very good. We're just yeah. getting in the habit of producing and then it gets better. Right. So that's how they got to that point. They didn't just start off uh, making great videos or, yeah. or hitting weights or whatever it is. And one thing that was interesting to me is early on with the editor is the idea of like, uh, like scaffolding, right? Is he's, you know, he's sitting there looking at something and he goes over and he goes, you know, like this paragraph here, I feel like this is scaffolding. Like this was, you know, you were, this was getting you to the point, right? And then like, but here, this next paragraph, this is good. And like, this is where the actual value is and the stuff is this paragraph before it, if we just, if it is, if it doesn't exist, then this is better, right? Yeah. And I look at it and I was like, I know exactly what you're saying and you are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. But then I took it as a positive thing. Like on one hand, I'm like, well, there goes 150 words. Um, (laughs) But um, but there's no point in having them just to have them there. Um, if they're just something. And so that's, you know, it's the idea of like, uh, yeah, you just got to start. Right. And it's true too. Every day you sit down to start writing. Um, you know, the most intimidating thing is a blank page. Right. And so you just got to start, start cranking on it and just start going. And with the understanding that maybe what you're starting with, um, is going to be good and, and usable or, or reworkable into something, or maybe it's just scaffolding. And if it takes you, you know, if it takes you, whatever one or two paragraphs to to find what what the fuck you're trying to actually say then that's okay right like uh, Mm -hmm. because it's it's clearly not happening just sitting here thinking yeah so um you know let's just kind of get get going on this and and kind of find find the find the path we're we're looking for along the way Mm -hmm. right um and you know that that reminds me of uh james clear you know the author of atomic habits oh yeah yeah He he knows a little bit about this type of stuff i think he sold over 10 million copies of that book uh, and allegedly knows allegedly i mean it, the, the, yeah, the jury is still out no he was number one uh number one uh non-fiction book on on all of amazon again like not categorically but like across the board again mm-hmm. so that was, he did it like two years ago and then he did it again this last year with the same book and i was so impressive uh but anyway I was, I was talking to him about a week ago and you know one thing that he said that really uh stood out to me is you know he said uh you know, so it's the idea of um, like the way he phrased it was was interesting. He said, you know, it's not it's a better question to ask, not um, what do I look like when I'm at my best, but what can I maintain when I'm at my when I'm when I'm at my worst, 
mm. right? Or am I, I'm, what can I do on my worst days? What can I, it's not, it's not like, what, I, what does it look like when I'm at my best? It's what can I, yeah, what can I do on my worst days, right? Mm -hmm. And like, that's a big part of it is just like, you just have to punch the clock and, and understand and setting goals, you know, that are, that are too lofty day to day, you know, then you're just gonna, you're not gonna reach them and you're gonna fail and it's gonna be frustrating. Instead, it's, um, something that I've, I've said for a long time is that, you know, you just have to establish a pattern of success, right? It's, it's the same idea. So it's, it's, if someone wants to lose a bunch of weight or start working out, they want to start working out. They say, okay, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to go to the gym every day after work. It's like, well, no, you're not. Like, that's, that's <laughs> not going to happen. Like, it's not going to happen. You're not going to go from zero days a, a week to five. Like that's, that's a terrible idea to set that as your goal. Cause then you're going to miss one day and you're going to feel like a failure and you're going to quit the whole thing. Right. Hmm. So you know, a better goal would be like, okay, let's just establish a pattern of success. And so you tell me what two days are you going to go? And you can look at your, they don't have to do the same two days. Every, look at your calendar ahead of time on Sunday. Like, okay. You know, Monday and Thursday, I'm going to go those two days, you know, and then, and then you do, and you maintain them. Then, you know, three or four weeks later, you've successfully gone two days a week. And you say, you know what, actually I could go a third now that I've been, now that I've been doing this, I see that. And then even if you do miss one of those days, you don't feel like a total failure because you know, like I had success going two days a week for four weeks and now, and I went three days a week for two weeks and then I missed a day. Well, it's not, you know, you don't feel like you're a, a, a total failure because you have this pattern of success that you establish and you can, you know, recall like, oh, well, I just missed one day. Whereas you say, I'm going to go five days a week and then a week two, you miss a day. Like mm -hmm. you don't, you never establish that, that confidence that you could, you can't actually do it. And it's like, oh, there I go. There I go again, not following through. Um, so, you know, just kind of, yeah, chipping away at things and establishing that pattern of success and, and setting, um, you know, habits and goals that, that you can accomplish um, even on days you don't feel like it. Um, and then the days are at your best, you can always do more, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. You were talking a couple of years ago, we had a conversation about like dietary goals and whatnot. And you said that, at least at the time that you allowed yourself to have either uh, an appetizer, a dessert, or a drink, not all three. And because you had those options, you wouldn't resent like a, a very, very strict diet. And there were times where you didn't feel like having all three or one of those three. And that was fine too. But by having that kind of built in, you were able to be more successful because it wasn't just a whole bunch of no's. Um, as far as like, like nutrition goals, things like that, uh, do you still follow that? Or are you onto something else or you're training for CrossFit games? So are you uh, cleaning things up a little bit more? Or you just have, uh, you know, I, I do different stuff with nutrition. I, it's funny right now we're doing this challenge at my gym and we got 75 people are doing this challenge. It's like weight loss or transformation challenge, whatever you want to call it. Um, and basically I told him like, all right, here's four, uh, whatever you want to say diets nutrition plans whatever that i have personally had success with all four of them and i have seen dozens if not hundreds of other people have success with all four of them and so which one kind of fits your lifestyle you know and so you kind of get that out of the way like the broad strokes and then you can kind of get into like now um tips and tricks or whatever you want to say um tactical things so if you're going out to dinner like what does that look like or how can you do that and still like stick to your goals maintain your goals that type of thing um and so so yes and no like that particular thing i do more or less at different times if i'm more on it you know if i'm if i'm currently in a in a phase where i'm really focusing on, on my nutrition then i'll absolutely do stuff like that um right now or another one is like it's like not don't snack like i've done that mm -hmm. before too we're like okay even if your, your food quality is high, you're like eating the right things. You know, if I was like, well, if I want to, whatever, just lose a few pounds, it's like, all right, I'm just going to not snack anymore. And like, I can eat as much as I want when I sit down for meals. But if it is outside of this meal, I'm just not going to eat anything. Um, and if I'm hungry between meals, then at my next meal, I'm just going to eat more and that's okay. But then the the reality of like, well, I'll just eat more of a next meal and then actually doing it oftentimes doesn't doesn't come out. But it's the idea of having, um, yeah, having a, a how, like a pressure valve, right? Like some sort of relief for you. You feel like uh, you have you have the control. You're not just being put upon the entire time. Um, so right now, actually, uh, my wife and I, like, we're basically it's like, okay, 
Um, I'm not going to say I'm drinking zero alcohol, uh, but I will say that like I am only having drinks on two days a week, period, non-negotiable, doesn't matter, like that's what's going on. And so then the same thing, it's like if um, you go to dinner, you pick the pick the days ahead of time, kind of look at the schedule looks like, and I'm going to be in Nashville on Wednesday, so I'll probably have some drinks on Wednesday night. And then whatever, we're going to dinner on Friday, we have date night on Friday. So like, there you go. And then, you know, you get into town, you get a, a day early and it's like, well, do I want to go out or it's like, well, nope. And I don't even feel like I'm missing out because mm-hmm. I already know that, you know, I have these two days on the calendar and whatever. Right. So like not doing something today isn't that big of a deal because I know that tomorrow I have that opportunity. And I and actually I could, if I wanted to tonight, I could make that choice. But that means that then I wouldn't tomorrow. And, you know, you make your you make your choices that way. So I think having some sort of a, um, yeah, like a pressure valve or, or a, you know, a light at the end of the tunnel or whatever you want to, however you want to word it is, is valuable for that. Right. Um, can you feel like nobody wants to feel like they're not in control and someone else is, you know, and you're getting these things imposed upon you. Right. You want to feel whether, whether real or imagined, you want choice. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I think having some frameworks that you work off of uh, really helps with that. I was reading, um, have you heard of Michael Easter? He's an author, uh, The Comfort Crisis and Scarcity yep. Brain, two, two great yep. books. Uh, I'm, I'm rereading The Comfort Crisis. And uh, he was talking about a study that showed people who were counting their calories, if they were thin or you know, had, a, had low uh, body fat, um, they underestimated their daily calories by about 200. So they thought that they were um, getting, you know, their, their, their caloric intake was about off by, by 200. But obese people were um, underestimating by 700. Oh, no, the, the, the overestimating, if you were thin in shape it was, or thin or in shape, it was overestimating by 200. But uh, obese was underestimating by 700, which is, that's a whole nother meal. And then the idea that like peanut butter, you know, thinking that a serving size, I think it's two tablespoons is 200 calories. And so if you're just crushing peanut butter because it's healthy, um, yeah, it's delicious, especially like the Jiffy, that's a lot of sugar, but uh, you you can think that you're eating really healthy. I'm going to have just peanut butter and orange juice. That's a lot of sugar. And again, it's, it's way better than having Skittles and a Red Bull spritzer. But sure. um, yeah, that sort of stuff can be can 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 trip you up uh, too when you start looking at that. Yeah, I, yeah, it's funny actually. This this one person in the challenge sent me an email. She's like, "Yeah, haven't had any you know, whatever two weeks." I'm like, "No success." I'm like, "I just send me a day. Just send me one day of eating, like whatever." And then uh, like plug it in my fitness pal, and then you know send send it over. And um, she's like, oh, "Okay." And then she did, and she's like, "Well, I figured some things out. Like, I didn't have to tell her anything. Like, she's like, ah, I figured some things out, right? I, uh, you know, I got, I got this latte, which, by the way, I had already like that was one of my tips. Is like, look, if you're serious, like you're taking these six weeks to really try to do this, like you drink coffee, black coffee, and water and tea. Those are your options, right? Like, pretty much. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, she said, uh, she's like, God, I got this latte, and like I was looking at it, I could not believe how much sugar." was in this thing I'm getting, like the sugar and the calories. I thought it was straightforward. Like she thought it was like coffee, milk, you know, whatever. Um, and made it at home. That's maybe what it would look like. But that's not necessarily the case, you know, if you're getting it from uh, the coffee shop, right? Especially if you're talking about like big chain type things, right? Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize like uh, whatever, like, you know, Starbucks specifically or, or whatever, Dunkin' Donuts, a lot of these like big chain coffee shops. Um, I mean, it's an ice cream store more than it's a coffee shop. You look at like their top products, you know, like some of the different frappuccinos and stuff. And these things have, you know, like literally like oh, more than half a cup of sugar, like in this drink, you know, and it's like, man, this is like the macros on this are closer to ice cream than mm-hmm. they are to, than they are to any, anything else. Right. And I think people just kind of don't realize that. And, you know, there's different, nutrition specifically like there's different ways to to do it you know as far as like if you want to some people really like to control and like counting calories and logging everything they eat and they actually find comfort in that because there's a certainty of what's going on and it's you know if you know if you're if someone's a, a cpa if you're an accountant you know the idea of logging every meal and analyzing the numbers probably gets you really like pumped up like that yeah. sounds great this is like yeah this is your idea of a good time you know 
Um, other people, not the case. Uh, you know, in fact, like personally, I've I've done that before. But personally, I, I don't, I'd rather not. Like, I just kind of want to uh, focus on the quality of foods, and I can set other parameters that that accomplish those goals for me, right? It's like, okay, like I don't eat anything with refined sugar, and I don't drink, um, you know anything whatever sugar beverages or whatever and then it's like oh or i don't snack between meals right like i said other little boundaries like this and for me i prefer that or or i've even done like i can snack like here's the the food that i can eat are as follows right and then it's like if you're hungry eat a snack it just has to be one of those things and you know if you follow that a lot of times then that can get you where you want to go but then sometimes you're doing that and it's not right and okay well i'm not getting the results i want then you'd say, okay, I'm going to take one day. And for this one day, I'm going to track everything, log everything. And that doesn't mean you have to do it forever. Just like one or two days, just one or two days, just record every single thing that you put in your mouth. And then, uh, then you can look at it and say, okay, oh, interesting. I'm actually eating 700 calories more than I thought I was, or I'm, I'm uh, actually not eating too many calories but it makes sense that i'm hungry all the time because my protein is like wait i'm barely eating any protein and look at all these these carbs i'm eating so you're having this insulin spike and this roller coaster of a thing or or whatever's going on um and so yeah just the awareness of taking one and you can do it's the same thing through time like people talk about productivity and time management um you know most people think oh i don't have time for this or that or whatever uh again like you set a timer to go off every 15 minutes and have a piece of paper and uh, every single 15 minute block, you write down exactly what you have been doing for the previous 15 minutes, right? Uh, sounds super annoying and tedious and it is, but do that for two days and you will learn some things about yourself and some mm -hmm. things about how you spend your time, you know? Um, and then in hindsight, it's like, man, I thought I was so busy, didn't have any time, but looking here, I spent um one hour uh doom scrolling on instagram i watched two hours of tv i whatever is going on right whatever's whatever's happening in your life um and so even someone who's extremely busy just doing that that little exercise you'd be amazed in fact uh when i was um i was at this business uh group this last week that's what i was in nashville for and someone said something that I thought was interesting and said, uh, I think he said he got it from Gary Vee or something. I don't, I don't really know. But uh, that anyone who's complaining about work-life balance uh, isn't doing enough work when they're at work. <laughs> and, and and I was like, man, that I think there's something to that, man. Like, say, you, say you're at work for eight hours and then you come home and you're like working outside of that time as well, right? Uh, most off, I mean, if you if you have different pursuits, it's one thing. If you're a teacher during the day and then you're coming home and working on your a side project afterwards, that that's maybe a different story. But in general, um, yeah, if you're at work for eight hours, like, have you ever like actually worked for eight hours? Like, that's a long time, man. Yeah. Like, that's a lot. Like, you can get a lot done in eight hours of actual work. Yeah. You know. Uh, and so most often, if you are, you know, pulling out the computer or, or at home and it's you know, whatever, nine o'clock at night and you're, you're trying to do something there. It's like, you probably could have done it earlier in the day, but you didn't have time, you know, yeah. because you were distracted doing other things, you yeah. know? Was it uh Tim Ferriss? That was uh, the four hour work week. Yeah. Uh, yep. And that that's just the, the condensing all of that value into like real work rather than you know, sloppy work. If you come home from work and you're smoked, that's probably a good thing. That means you had some good work. And if I come home from, from teaching and I have all of this energy and intellectual energy, then, well, I mean, should, should more of that gone into uh, educating the, uh, the, the youth there? So. Yeah. I probably um, spent a lot of time mailing it in. Right. Yeah. Like, that's the, like I'm the, my, yeah, my arm's so tired from mailing it in all day. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, reaching in my snack drawer to have a Snickers and uh, drink a Diet Cokes. <laughs> like that's the, the teacher stereotype. Um, yeah. The, the, the thing about those like nutrition and eating goals, it's, it seems like a lot of people think that it's about people who are really, really strict and they want us to look a certain way and, and this and that. But a lot of it is just, it's, it's, you just feel good. Like you're solving the problem of not feeling 
um, good all the time. You're feeling tired or you're feeling this or that. And so it's, it's solving a problem to get this sort of stuff. And when you can have strawberries or a, a pineapple in the morning and it tastes super, super sweet, almost overly sweet, granted, you know, I'm sure they pump a little bit of extra sugar in there somehow, but you know, that's way different. Like when that can satisfy, uh, the, the sugar oh, yeah. intake, like that's, that's, it's so great. That's a good feeling to have. I'm not a fitness junkie. I'm not a fitness influencer thing, just an ordinary person who wants to just feel better. Like you're solving that problem. And that's a huge motivator rather than I have to, my war on sugar. It's like, no, this is a, this is a crusade to feel better. Yeah, it's little things, right. Uh, you know, uh, my weight kind of fluctuates over the course of a year, uh, two or three times. Um, not like huge swings, whatever, but you know, we're talking, you know, five to, you know, five to eight pounds or whatever. Right. Um, if I've been traveling a lot, you know, and eating out a lot type stuff, maybe it goes up, you know, four or five part of it's just hanging out on the water rate as well. But, um, and then it's like, okay, now I'm, I'm, I kind of hit this point where I'm not really as comfortable as I'd like to be. So you just kind of clean it up a little. Okay. No problem. You know, and just make some minor changes. And over the course of a few weeks, you kind of drop down another, drop down that, you know, whatever, one to two pounds a week, right? So you, so over the course of a month, you clean it up and you drop down four or five pounds and then you feel so much better and then kind of live like that for a few months and something holiday season comes around and whatever, maybe your weight goes up a little bit during that time, but it's okay. You're not stressed out because you know, like, all right, clean the stuff up and it comes these three or four pounds. And it's, I'm not advocating a yo-yo dieting, but I think there's a big difference between um, gaining and losing 20 pounds every single year and just kind of having a, you know, four or five pound range of kind of where you're, where you're floating around at for whatever reasons, you know? And uh, so with that being said is when I'm at the upper end of kind of where my weight ever goes, like as, as, as sloppy as I get type thing, which is again, you know, whatever, four, five, at most, maybe, you know, seven or eight pounds. And again, you know, I weigh over 200 pounds. I weigh 200 pounds. So it's like, we're talking about percentage of body weight here, right? Like four, whatever, 4% of your body weight is like 2%, right? Like not, or four pounds is 2% of my body weight. So it's not like this huge flux. But uh, like, I can, man, just different things in life aren't as comfortable. You know, it's not just the jeans feel a little tighter. It's like, man, the way the seatbelt rests across your stomach is like, isn't as comfortable as you'd like it to be. Or, you know, sitting in this chair, you know, man, shirt little tight when I'm sitting down in this position that's not as comfortable as it as it you know I'd like it to be or whatever right and it's like just these little things that you you maybe wouldn't notice especially if it's just part of the norm but then when you know what it feels like to to feel good from the uh, standpoint of like energy levels and like feeling good but then that transfers from not just the energy levels and motivation and then it goes all the way into like actual physical discomfort at times that's unnecessary you know, it's like, man, when I weigh four pounds less, the seatbelt is a lot more comfortable across my lap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And it's just, it's the little things like that. And then not to mention, you know, energy level and attention and um, th those types of things that, that definitely have a big impact as well. Mm -hmm. We're coming up uh, close to an hour here. So um, I do want to talk about your, is, is, an, is it the yearly goal that you have to uh, sweat every day? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, how long that's going to go. I, uh, I like streaks. I like doing things, um, day after day and stacking. I have a, a buddy who likes to say stacking victories, right? Like I, I like to, um, I like to do that. It feels good. Um, I think the 30 days, a lot of people do like little 30 day things and that's great. Uh, but also I feel like everyone does 30 days. And so I got to do at least 31. Uh, and then once you made it to 31, you're like, well, shit. I mean, if I do one more, that's 32. That seems better than 31. Mm -hmm. And just kind of seeing where it goes. And I get into the, usually into the 40s, you know, with different stuff and sometimes beyond. Um, uh, I have not made it a goal to do this sweat every day for an entire year. Um, I've toyed with it a little bit. I've kind of like, that idea has bounced around my head a little, but I haven't actually uh, committed to it. But I have committed to just like doing it as long as, I want to do it right now. And part of that is, is posting, you know, like a reel as well. I've gone through stretches where I said, okay, you know, here's a good way to do things, right? It's like for business, if I understood um, like Instagram reels and was just whatever, that would help. That'd be good. That'd be good for business. I don't even run our Instagram, but you know, we all talk about stuff and I figure I'll learn some things. Right. 
that could maybe help influence some stuff we do. And so I said, okay, I'm just going to post a reel every day for 30 days. I have a minimum of 30 days or more. We'll see. I'm just going to start. I'm going to do it every day. And once I hit 30, I can stop anytime. Mm -hmm. But um, I also don't have to stop, you know? And I think I ended up going whatever it was. Yeah, 46 or something like that. But, and I learned a ton. Like I kind of figured out like what little things can make a difference or what things do like um, whatever bolster views or engagement or whatever, that type of stuff, um, you know? Uh, and it was, it was interesting. And so, but I haven't, I kind of stopped doing that. And part of the whole thing is, I need to start again, um, especially as I'm writing this book and, and been doing this launch with it and stuff like that. I, I, um, as much as I don't like the idea of uh, my social media being a big part of my life, the simple fact is it's a way to get out and get in front of people and talk to people and share ideas and, and communicate and actually use it what it's intended for. I right? have it be a social uh, connection, right? It's a social thing. We're actually interacting with people and that type of stuff. So that's a big part of it. Well, I don't want to start, I need to start being more active on, on social media. And I know that I'm good with streaks. And I know that if I say I'm going to post twice a week, then I probably wouldn't because that's not enough structure for me. I need more structure than that. Um, and so I said, okay, well, I'll do it every day. I'll also do a, a, a post. I'll do a reel every single day. And all right. So, and also I know that I want to be more active and I don't want to take, I don't want to take days off. Doesn't mean that I'm busting my nuts every day, but you know, like I just want to work up a sweat. I need to move my body enough to where my pores open and liquid comes out. Like that's mm -hmm. like where it's at. And it's a lot, 10 minutes, you know, a lot of times 10 minutes or less, you can get that done. Um, and so even on days where I'm not, you know, going to the, the gym or, or whatever, I find something to do for that. So kind of, for me, it's accomplishing both things. It's, uh, it's motivating me to not skip any days. And so example you know i i when i went out to nashville i was i was flying like all day i left here at whatever six in the, or left here at seven in the morning to go to the airport or actually six thirty to go to the airport so i had to stop at the warehouse on the way there and but before i i got to write 2500 words a week and so i'm like so spend the morning writing and then i'm in an airport or an airplane all day i get out there and then you know next thing i know it's i i didn't i needed to do something and so at 11 o'clock at night in my hotel room I did a little workout, broke a sweat, got the job done. Mm -hmm. uh, if I was not doing this streak, I definitely would not have done that. Right. I would have been like, oh man, it's like, I got all kinds of excuses why this is not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what, man, it took like seven minutes, dude. And like afterwards, I felt really good about doing this thing that I wanted to do. Um, and same thing, like coming home, you know, I, my flight left super early. Um, and I, uh, you know, I got back, I'm like driving home. I actually had to stop by the warehouse and stop and do a few things on the way home from the airport. And uh, I had to, like stop by the bank and like it was this whole thing. Anyway, um, and so then I'm like, well, once I walk in that door and those kids, you know, like I'm not going to be leaving to go work out again. And I also, I knew I kind of had a little bit of work. I knew that I needed uh, like 45 minutes of like computer time also at some point that evening. And so the last thing I want to do is take more time away from my, my family doing stuff. And so I just stopped on the way home. I just like stopped the climbing gym, 30 minutes, went in, got it done, broke a sweat, and it felt good. So like mm -hmm. there are times where you can fit stuff in if it's a priority, right? And so sweat every day is an excuse for me to do two things, which is um, consistently post on social media and consistently break a sweat and do both of those things on the days where I don't want to do either. Moving that, moving that baseline up and... When you that goes back to that James Clear quote you talked about, uh, like at your best, everyone can can crush it. But how many days are you absolutely at your best? But if your baseline is higher than it was because of these little little habits, then way way better. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly it. Like if, if I did anything to sweat, that is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And if I mail in this post, like I just grab a ten second clip and post it to whatever audio is the first one they suggest. Um, there you go. That's fine. It's out there. I did it. I didn't miss a day. And then on the days you feel good, you can get more into it. The days you're feeling creative, you can spend a little more time on those posts or the days you, you know, whatever. So yeah, that's it. What is the, yeah, set your baseline as something that you can, that you can always muster up the energy to do. And then on the days you're feeling good, you can, you can attack them a little more. Yeah. Well, that's a good closer, man. Thanks again for being on here. Thanks again. Uh, 
Well, I, when people ask me why I started the podcast, I always say my buddy Danny, he always has ideas for me to do. And I just, I just do whatever he tells me. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And that's okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, like, that's just exactly. the same with my life. Yeah. Um, no. yeah. Thanks again, man. Uh, people can follow you. Um, well, how does that happen? And then uh, you can so, pitch your coffee of the month. If you sign up for caffeine and kilos, get them, uh, get, get them all that. And then your newsletter, how can they get on your newsletter? Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned a, a few times about writing this book. Um, the working title is win your next hour. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you want to be involved with that, um, so I'm actually, one thing I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be the official launch is, is going to be, I think August, something like that. Um, but I'm going to do a pre-launch and kind of get people who want to be involved with it involved. And then we do some stuff, get a group together and people can help pick, you know, the cover art um, and as well as like the content within the chapters. I think that initial group that wants to get involved, I'll, you know, throw a throw chapter one out there and then everyone can kind of put in their own comments and suggestions and, and what they think, what, what they found valuable or invaluable and, and that type of thing um, and give me direct feedback on that. And we'll kind of go through then. So not only have a chance to kind of uh, read the book for anybody else, but actually have some a real say on the stuff that's going in there, um, that type of stuff. That should be a lot of fun. So if, that, if you're interested in that, you know, want to kind of get early access to it and everything, um, just go to dannylear.com, L-E-H-R, Tyson Lear, dannylear.com, and just sign up on the, the newsletter there. Um, then that's that's one way I'm going to be kind of letting people know as soon as that's, that's available. And then on, on social media, Instagram is pretty much all I use. Um, and that's just danny underscore Lear. Again, Lear is L-E-H-R. So that's, those are two ways uh, to find me. And of course, caffeineandkilos.com, coffee of the month. Every month you get a different blend and they're delicious. They're all organic, sustainably farmed. I mean, what else, what else do you want, you know? Yeah. I get the, uh, used to get the night or PR blend. Now we get the night train. Oh, the night train coming. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Well, well we, thanks again, we, man, for being on here. Appreciate it. Looking forward to uh, seeing what you come up with with the book. Sounds good. Appreciate it, Jeff. Have a have a great day. You too.